Welcome to Holistically Speaking. I'm Hilary Russo, Certified Holistic Health Coach and Health and Wellness Journalist. This is an empowering place to explore self-awareness, self-love, and transformation through health, healing, and humor. By sharing life-changing experiences, knowledge, and guests with varied expertise, we'll explore who we are, how we got that way, and what it takes to be a happy and healthy grown-up. Mind, body, and spirit. I'm glad you're here. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Holistically Speaking. I am your host, Hilary Russo, and I am so, so grateful to hold space for my guest today. Chris Shembra joins us. If you don't know him, you should. If you don't know him, you will. He's the best-selling author of Gratitude and Pasta, the secret sauce for human connection, chronicling all of his adventures as one of the most sought-after dinner hosts in the world. Forbes has just ranked his book as the number two book of 2020 to create human connection, and USA has given him the title of Gratitude Guru. I love that. Who doesn't want to be called that? He is the founder plus chief question asker of 747, an advisory firm which helps companies give the gift of community and belonging to their VIP clients and partners, and having used the signature pasta sauce to spark over 400,000 relationships around the dinner table, their core method is that giving gratitude to others is the key to fulfillment and ultimately good for business. And by the way, personal life as well. Chris, so great to have you. What a pleasure to share the table with you today. I'm so excited to be here. And I I love uh, I love everything that you do and what you stand for. Mm. So I know it's going to be a great conversation. Well, I, I totally agree. It really is about letting your vibe create your 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 tribe, really. And, uh, you know, just getting into that. I mean, we we met recently, really, and uh, we can talk about that a little later. But being able to come together with people that you didn't know and create new relationships and new connections with them is really what you're all about. So I want to just no pun intended. I want to just dig in. Okay. Um, let's talk about 747. When I first learned about it, I didn't even know what 747 meant. And I'd love for you to mm-hmm. expand on that a little bit. Yeah. You know, 747 is um, <clears throat> a time of evening in which a great magic occurs. So there, there is a, there are the two dots between the seven and the four. So it's actually, you know, the, a timestamp. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, to answer that question, we got to, we got to go back about five years, uh, to July of 2015. If, if you looked at my life at that time, things looked completely different. I had, I had spent, uh, many years in show business, putting on plays all around the world and having a really good time doing it. We were producing Broadway shows, touring shows, social media campaigns, and everything looked great on paper. But just because something looks good on paper doesn't mean it feels good in the heart. And that kind of low point, which we've all been through, in you know July of 2015, I had just come back from Italy after producing a Broadway play over there. And when I got back to New York City, I realized this isn't it. I am not aligned with what I need to be doing. I felt four things in that deep, dark moment. Lonely, unfulfilled, disconnected, and insecure. And I had no choice but to try to claw my way out. You know, I've got the, I've got the marks on, I've got the scars of suicide, depression, jail, rehab on the resume. And I thought back to what I loved most about Italy that sparked this kind of new awakening. And I realized it was the food. And so in my 350 square foot studio apartment at the time, I started playing around with a bunch of different recipes and I accidentally invented a pasta sauce recipe. And I figured, you know, I should probably feed it to people to see if it's even good or not. So I decided I would host a dinner. And on July 15th of that, you know, that very same month, uh, we invited uh, 15 of my friends who didn't know each other over to our home. 6.30 p.m. cocktails began. 8 p.m. dinner was served. But at 7.47 p.m., 
because it takes 13 minutes to cook pasta al dente. We put the pasta in the pot and actually delegated a bunch of tasks to empower the attendees to work together to create the experience. And so we realized that by first drinking together and then working together and then eating together, you would really set the table for some really good conversation. And we had a wonderful time at that very first dinner. They loved the sauce. They loved the conversation. Uh, you know, we looped in some gratitude and we just haven't stopped since. So that that time, the 7.47 p.m. is such a magical moment in, in our existence. Well, you know, it's it's funny because before I realized what 7.47 was, before joining you virtually on the 7.47 Club, which is a I don't even, I don't have any comparison to the ones in person because you created the virtual uh, way of doing this, which I loved. I absolutely loved. And we'll, I'd love to know how that's different for you, doing them virtually and doing them in person. How have you been able to create that sense of connection and gratitude by using a different platform than just sitting face to face and eye to eye with people? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, my, for the listeners, uh, you know, out there that heard your, you know, initial kind of bio of, you know, we've used pasta sauce to spark over 400,000 relationships, right? The dinner table, you know, is what saved our life and we became very addicted to it. So this was more than our identity. It was a, it was a way of survival, the dinner table. So when this nasty disease came into play and we realized we couldn't host in-person experiences, but we had to pivot to digital. At first, I was a little bit weary. I said, how could we, how could we translate what we do? But then I had a conversation with my good buddy, Cal Fussman. Cal, when he was a kid, he, uh, he had one goal in life. And that was to interview Muhammad Ali for a sports paper. And he accomplished his life dream, life goal, at the age of 18. So he said, oh, crap, what do I do next? So he realized he wanted to travel. He took whatever money he had in his bank account, and he sailed off to Europe. And he floated around from town to town, family to family, country to country. And when the money ran out, he would do some odd jobs here and there, and and he would live off the generosity of uh, of the continent. And he learned so much over those ten years traveling in Europe that when he came back to America, he decided to start a column at Esquire magazine called "What I What I've Learned," where he would fly around the world interviewing presidents, kings, queens, dictators, sports stars, etc about the wisdom in their life. And when the 2008 financial crisis hit, his boss called him up and said, Cal, we don't have the budget anymore to send you around the world interviewing these people. Cal said, what? What am I going to do? He said, you're going to have to do it digitally. You're going to have to do it <laughs> via you know, Skype at the time. Cal said, you can't ask me to interview Mikhail Gorbachev on Skype. That'll never work. But nonetheless, he had to do his part. And what he found, as he told me recently on, I went on his podcast, what he found was that when you're sitting digitally via Zoom across from someone, you're actually very intimate. You are like 10 inches away from the screen. So you're very close to that other person. That person is in their home, so you get to actually learn more about that person and empathize with that person to a greater ability than, you know, if you guys just met at a restaurant or something. And when he told me that, that really gave us permission to say, let's let's create a posture of openness and 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 be okay with change. So, you know, we tried to when we looked at the elements of our dinner that worked so well, we tried to bring as much of it 
as possible into our virtual experiences. And really what we have to highlight is three things, structure, gratitude, and food. You know, when, um, when people arrive to our virtual dinners, they arrive having prepared food, which seems so simple, but just the act of putting in sweat equity to prepare to arrive to a virtual dinner, it almost recreates that 747 experience of people working together to create the meal. People show up with <laughs> whether they've spent four hours making a pot roast or a ragu a la bolognese, or they're a single mother of three who's homeschooled and work from home and fed the kids at five, put them to bed at seven, and now they're just drinking a bottle of wine with chocolate. So you really get to see people as they are. And that, yeah, in their own homes, really. Uh -huh. I mean, they're in their own homes, they're in their own environment. So it really is a shared experience even more so because while you're hosting them still, there's still that feeling of, but we need, we're need we respecting each other's space even yeah. more because thank you for welcoming me in. Thank you for letting me be part of your home and your process. So it's um, it, 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 it's pretty neat in that aspect. But really the main part of the experience that we look to recreate is the gratitude. Mm -hmm. And at every dinner, we ask the same question. From the first dinner to now tonight's dinner, we ask a very simple question. If you could give credit or thanks to one person in your life that you don't give enough credit or thanks to, who would that be? And we ask that question very strategically. We're not asking our dinner table, what's your biggest fear? What's your biggest failure? What do you do for a living? You know, what's your biggest goal? That, that Those are either intimidating questions or they're bullshit surface level questions. We're asking them to pause and reflect on their past and tell a story of someone who helped them get to where they are today that they've just never thanked. And so what happens, it's scientifically proven that when you can use gratitude as a tool to recall positive autobiographical memories from your past, that enhances well-being. What we're also doing yeah. is some sometimes people will tell a story of someone that wronged them. And so we're actually helping them have a cathartic, what we call gratitude intervention to get over a negative relationship in their life so that they can release that strain from the past. This impacts well-being and this helps, you know, gratitude helps form pro-social bonds, which lead to lasting loyalty and trust mm -hmm. and empathy and well-being. So many things. Yeah, I, I love that you mentioned that because just in my own experience, and I did not think I was going to go there, joining you on that first dinner virtually, when I was asked that question, and I'm used to the one asking the question. So already right there, you know, holding space for somebody to be able to ask me um, was one thing. But then being asked that question, I found myself thanking a relationship that had done me wrong. Uh, somebody that was a, a former, you know, my ex that I felt was, there was a toxicity to it. But in that moment, when, uh, when even you mentioned that the top people, most people ask, uh, I mean, at, most people think are their family, like their parents, their siblings, a friend or a stranger or someone who's done you wrong. I, I actually found myself thanking that relationship because it brought me to where I am today and it's allowing us to release. And by having gratitude and being in a state of gratitude is something I always share with my clients. Like, let's find one thing that we can savor in our lives or gratitude or have grateful feelings towards. And you find yourself in a much more happy state. You know, even, all the crap we go through is going to bring us to the good. Right. Oh, yeah. So I love, I love that you do that. And I want to mention too, with the book and just in the sauce in general, um, the, the book Pasta and Gratitude, you mentioned that it's about gratitude, it's about empathy, and it's about connection. And the book itself is not necessarily this 
long winded story where well, we all have stories and every single one of them is valid and beautiful, but it really, you set up the story like you did just today of what brought you to the 747 club and the happening and creating, but also you kind of give chapter by chapter, the breakdown of how to create your own dinner party, you know, which I love that you do that and how that is the catalyst for success. Because the dilemma we have, the catalyst dilemma, as you mentioned in the book, is is that most connected people are actually the most disconnected. And we've mm-hmm. seen that. We've seen that with famous people, celebrities. We've seen that with people you think are going to be so happy in their lives. And yet they're the most unhappy because you can be the popular person in the room or the popular person, the person that links people together and still not be invited to the party. And you dealt with that yourself, yeah? Yeah, you know, you know, just for for the audience that's listening to this, you bring up such a great point, Hillary, is that, you know, sometimes the the extroverted, you know, popular <laughs> party hosting, you know, those people that you think of in your life, they're who you need to reach out to the most through this crisis. Those are the people um that when the when the when the drinks run out and the lights go off, everybody's going home for the night. And they're sitting mm-hmm. there saying, all right, here I am. Now what do I do? And, you know, that's loneliness. That's insecurity. Mm-hmm. My, insecu- my greatest childhood insecurity, as you're alluding to, is, you know, always being the last one called to the party. My invite, Hillary, was somehow always and still is lost in the mail still still oh yeah oh yeah Mm -hmm. the um once you know once you realize what your insecurities are just because you work on them at an aggressive pace doesn't mean they're going away they're still Mm -hmm. there and that's what makes you beautiful and unique uh but time after time in my life today uh you know I feed tens of thousands of people per year, but I don't necessarily get the reciprocal invitation. I've set up my life to where I know a lot of people and I know a lot of different groups. You know, there's great power and privilege that comes in knowing a diverse group of individuals. But one of the negative, negative things about it is that, um, you know, everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's always just assuming you're being taken care of by the other group. So why call Chris? He's probably already taken care of, right? He's just going to say no, right? So how many times in my life was I the, you know, I'd, I'd call up a buddy and say, hey, what are you guys doing tonight? And he'd say, hey, we're, we're, we're over at, uh, we're over at such and such's house. Uh, we just popped on a movie. You want to come over? Uh, Sure. Yeah, love to come over, and I get there, and there's no seat on the couch. They're halfway right, through the movie. Right, it's second hand. It's yeah. not intentional to leave people out. It's more it's like, not. like no, you said, it's just we just assumed you had something going on because you're I, always doing. I am very privileged in that, with the type of investment we've made in relationships over the years, we've got an army of supporters. When I need something, my community really shows up, but. Connectors, we have to overly communicate what we need. Because if we don't communicate what we need, people won't know what to give. They'll just assume you're already taken care of. And if I just communicate to my audience once a year saying, invite me to more parties, please, please, the invites will come. It is important. I think you're making a really valid point. It's not just up to others to include us, but it's up to us to have the power yeah. to realize that we are we are worth including. That's why it's so, so cool, Michael Roderick's group, the Gate Group. Yeah. Which stands for which, Give, Ask, Thank, Experiment. You know, he's so good at helping people get out of their comfort zone to tell people what they need. That's how we found each other. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. both of us knowing Michael, uh, he he is also one of those people that has his own sauce in a way by bringing people together. And he's so good at connecting people who are in familiar areas or similar areas, but also those who might be able to branch out. And I've seen that over the last decade 
being around Michael, who and the gate group is great. It brought you and I together and connected, which has been fabulous. And you never know what can manifest from all of that. So kudos to Michael Roderick. We'll give him a shout out for sure. <laughs> um, the one thing I want to mention is uh, going back to the actual book itself, uh, the idea of the sauce. The sauce is really twofold, isn't it? The sauce is the sauce you're actually creating during the dinner with the pasta, but the sauce is actually the method as well of, of creating and connecting. So the empathy was your art, as you mentioned, but mm-hmm. the dinner was your medium. Ah, yeah. I forgot that line. Holy moly. Yeah. I, I, I need, oh, I read your book. <laughs> I, I, I need to read that book too. One of these days. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> sounds like a good one. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. And it's not too old. I mean, this is something you just kind of put out there, which I love that it, it it's kind of the platform or the workbook to creating connection. And in the most simplest forms, we all got to eat. Yeah, the um, you know, we had great plans for it in 2020. Uh, you know, for, for those of you who are listening, this this book came out on April 7th. And by that point, we were already uh, you know two and a half weeks in to uh, mm, quarantine, and yeah. so it it uh, there were many many corporate events and uh, large gatherings and large bulk buys and all the stuff that you know you do on a book tour um, that all had to be put on hold or mm, probably canceled. Um, so it, we had great great plans for it. And uh, we were going to use 2020 um, to set up the scene to release online courses around the principles in the book in 2021. So that'll just look a little bit different now. Um, But we might actually have a better ability to do that now that we have the time to build our audience now. Um, Mm -hmm. So it should definitely be interesting. Yeah, I want to touch on that too, because I feel that there are people that I come in contact with virtually right now, where we're being overwhelmed on social media, hearing people talking about, oh, I just want to go back to the way things were. And this is really messing up my day. And this is, you know, life is not as good anymore. And I'm thinking, well, we're not going to go back. And I try to delicately share that with people. It's about moving forward. It's about a new normal. And a new normal could be the smallest thing, like you're being given the space. The the universe is holding space for you right now to create something even bigger and better for the 747 Club, for launching uh, your program out of Gratitude and Pasta in a whole different way. I've found this time myself to learn new things, mm-hmm. uh, to, to take, I I'm taking a course right now at Yale on the science of well being. How <laughs> I, would I do that before? I don't know, you know? So I think having this time and space, like you mentioned, will give you a much larger playing field to be able to launch this in a greater magnitude because your mindset is going there. And isn't that really what it's all about? It's about connecting to self too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Take a step back and connect to self, everybody, because what was planned has the ability to change around. And I know, Chris, from reading your book, you like being in control. <laughs> <laughs> so changing things a little bit, how how does that feel to have to change the trajectory of things that you had so well planned? Um. I'm I'm surprisingly all right with it. Um, cool. I like to hear that. I I am a uh, I I am a perpetual underdog. I've always mm-hmm. been the the short, scrappy, hustling, creative kind of thing. So when life gives me lemons, mm-hmm. I I really I really put in the work to to do something with it. Um, at the same time that I'm accepting, you know, the other parts of me that need nourished, which is the, you know, the, the lazy, uh, slow, you know, uh, take care of plants and, and make sourdough bread kind of, kind of things. Um, you know, I've, I've never, I've never been home this much ever. Uh, I've, 
<laughs> I'm always traveling. I'm always hustling. I'm always doing something. And, you know, now it's just me, my girlfriend, our plants. Uh, we had a foster puppy for a little bit. I, my life now is kind of very similar to the region of Emilia Romagna in Italy. Hmm. And this is, this, this is a great example um, of, a, of the, the dichotomy of individuals. I used to think that, you know, I used to think that I had to be kind of halfway in between a crazy hustle guy and a lazy, you know, slow guy. I used to think I had to find Zen in between, but no, I'm, I'm borderline bipolar and I'm cool with that. Um, the land of Emilia Romagna is such a great case study. It's a, a land of, of, it's a land of, of two different energies. Uh, they call it slow food and fast cars. The region is the largest exporter of uh, food in Italy and a great exporter of culture. You've got four towns, four big towns in Emilia Romagna. You have Bologna, which is where Tortellini and Tagliatelle and uh, Ragù alla Bolognese and Mortadella, which is known as Bologna. Uh, it also has the oldest university in the world is there. Uh, the town next to it is called Modena. Modena is known as the land of uh, balsamic vinegar. The Modena, mm -hmm. which, which you know, takes 25 to 120 years, you know, just to be good. Um, Modena is the birthplace of Luciano Pavarotti mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. an opera. But it's also the land of... Uh, the birthplace of Ferrari, Lamborghini, De Tommaso, Ducati. And then the, the town next to it is Reggio Emilia, which is known for Parmigiano Reggiano, which is <laughs> another slow food. You know, it takes a couple of years mm -hmm. to age. And then the town next to it is called Parma, with prosciutto di Parma, mm -hmm. which again takes a few years. So it's the land of slow food and fast cars. And that's my life right now. I am, on one hand, still an opportunist. You know, I just, you know, I just keep keep going and keep hustling. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, I'm studying plants and I'm slowing down and I'm sitting and taking time for myself. So it's it's good to be a little of both for me. Yeah, I love uh, that you, you kind of created such a visual right there. That first of all, I want to hop on a plane to Italy right now and connect to my Italian roots. But the other thing I love about the visual you created is it reminds me so much of another thing you mentioned in the books that you and I are so on the same page here, the blue zones, which Italy has areas that are considered the blue zones, um, which I love talking about these areas. And I would love to move to one myself. But that whole idea of the longevity that people are seeing that are living in areas of the blue zone where what matters is connection and community and, you know, good food and, and sustainability and the, the things that the, the principles that make up the blue zones, uh, it is so much based on community and connection and eating well mm -hmm. and enjoying the time. These people are living to their, into their one hundreds because of that. And they're living well. It's not like they're living connected in to different kinds of uh, um, medical devices. They're living well and they're happy. So that kind of visual kind of is what makes me think about your Italian adventure, you know, <laughs> uh, it really does. And then you're bringing it back in with this, the pasta and gratitude, you know, and that, that just, it just seems like it truly is the sauce of life is connection, community, gratitude, empathy, empathy for self, empathy for others. The resonance that we sometimes miss is we need to be able to see what it's like to be in the other person's shoes. Oh yeah. Um, you know, the resonance of life, um, which is, is so important. And if more people feel that way and see things that way, I think we can connect more and your dinners give that opportunity to connect and listen, to be, the observer. And briefly, I just want you, you don't, you don't actually 
the the question doesn't normally come to you though because I've again I've only done it virtually but do you get asked that question what is one person or who is one person you would uh say you're grateful for in the in person dinners I do mm-hmm. um so at the in person dinners we take an hour and a half just to go around so our in person dinners are 3 hours long 3 hours and 2 minutes mm-hmm. long and so the last hour and a half of the evening is every single person goes around the table and shares for you know 2 to 3 minutes on their gratitude mm-hmm. the gratitude share and i i usually get picked on and so i i get to share mm-hmm. but at the virtual dinners when we throw, oh, I don't know if you can hear those chickens in the background. I do. I was like, is that a peacock? What is yeah. that? No, I we're <laughs> here. We are in the dead center of Chelsea in the middle of New York City. <laughs> and on the other side of our back, I'm here in our backyard. And on the other side of our backyard wall is a chicken coop. Uh, I love it. We get fresh eggs from the chickens. And uh, wow. you know, it feels like we're at the farm. It's crazy. Um, but no, at, at the, uh, at the, <laughs> I love it though. Nobody would ever assume that from New York, you know? So funny. Um, but at the virtual dinners, you know, the, the whole experience is built on breakout rooms. So we Mm -hmm. throw people out into, you know, the breakout rooms to do their gratitude shares and, and, you know, in their small groups. And I'm just sitting there twiddling my thumbs in the main room Mm -hmm. alone. So I always wonder what you're doing. I've been wondering the last two dinners. I'm like, what is he doing while we're in these breakout rooms? I, is he in a breakout room? <laughs> no, I just sit there and kind of twiddle and I got it. <laughs> answer emails. And yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm time keeping cause I have to tell people, sure. you know, when to switch and all that jazz, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, um, it's not as emotionally fulfilling for mm-hmm. me to be there you know, for the people. Well, I got to be honest, I would love the opportunity to be in the room when all this is giving us a chance to get back in the room together, because I'd, I'd love to see the difference. Uh, oh, I've already oh, oh, felt a connection from doing it the other way, but oh, I'm a gal that loves to connect. Yeah. It's, so it's, 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 yeah. it's nuts. Um, and you've been, you've actually been in the room and you've actually hosted these for huge companies, you know, Fortune 500 companies and had some really big players in the room, yeah. people that two big players that didn't even have any likeness of being in the room normally. And you mentioned that also in the book. But if you had a chance, and I know we have a few minutes left, if you had one person you could have at your table, who would it be that you haven't yet? And you've had some heavy hitters. <laughs> my, 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 my first boss in New York okay. City. Really? Uh-huh. Tony. Tony. Lo Bianco. Okay. Big How about that? You haven't had him at your table, but you've been at his. I built my entire business because I had been to his dozens of times. Isn't that something? Um, but he's not I don't know what it is, but he's just yeah. never said yes. Yet. And even if he doesn't say yes, Chris, it's it's something that the reflection you know is not on you. It's something that Tony is working through. And you know what? You've shared many dinners. So, but that's great that you're putting that out there. I love that, you know, because it seems like what, what you had with him and manifested with him in your theater days brought you to this, you know? So there's, there's something to savor in the sauce of what was before the sauce you have now, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, him, him, not, that. him not coming is part of the fuel mm-hmm. that makes me succeed. Cool. Uh, so that's, that's I, a big thank you as well, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I always <laughs> have a chip on my shoulder to prove mm-hmm. to a lot, a lot of people what I'm doing. And does it, does mm-hmm. it get me into trouble by overly promoting myself sometimes? Yes, of course. Um, you know, I am a shameless self promoter. Um, we love what we do. We're very hungry for it. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's those kind of relationships. The people that keep saying no to us are the people we keep in a very compartmentalized box to say, thank Mm. you for the fuel. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's a good way of thinking about it, you know, turning it into a positive. So real quick, I want to do this um, quick rapid fire with you. I've collected some words that kind of are in alignment with your book. Once again, Gratitude and Pasta, The Secret Sauce of Human Connection. Um, so give yourself, you know, take a deep breath. We're going to go here. I want you to just shoot out a word with each word I say. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you ready? Okay. Pasta. Sauce. Sauce. Red. Cooking. Joy. Dinner. Comfy. Italian. Rome. Hmm. Theater. Sex. Nature. <laughs> Musky. Role play. Kink. <laughs> Addiction. Washington. And the last one, gratitude. Orange. Interesting. <laughs> so I, I, I think you know where I'm coming from with some of those. You know, I went back to your elements, which I love, having the elements of the dinner. Uh, again, folks, get this book, read it. It's it's the sauce of life, of creating really good connection with people. Absolutely loved reading it. It's such an easy read, too, because really just the first part of it, uh, first, I don't know, not even 20 pages is really your story. And then the rest of it is just sharing with people the step-by-step approach to creating that dinner and that, uh, that, that 747 club of their own. But then here's what really I loved about the book. I was like, oh, gosh, I have to get through this by the tomorrow's interview, blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, holy crap, the, the last 12 to 15 pages are all acknowledgement. <laughs> and I I was so blown away by that, not because it was like 12 to 15 less pages I had to get done before you know, taking my notes. I felt like I was back in college. It was it was the true truth behind who you are. I mean, who has 12 to 15 pages of acknowledgments? You know? <laughs> so to me, that was the ultimate gratitude moment. You know? I loved it. I, I, and I have to go through it and read everybody. I'm like, hey, am I in there? <laughs> like, who didn't you think? <laughs> but I I saw like you gave really brief acknowledgments with just names. And then I saw that you actually mentioned people with a little bit of substance. But I love that because it really, to me, we, shared who you are. We spent you know. probably two weeks on the acknowledgments alone. I mm. I had to weed out. We that That is a very short list. Uh, 15 pages is a short list because there's been, there's been an army of people who have had an impact on me, uh, hmm. whether it's growing up or, or here. And I really tried to, um, it's also just good for book sales. Cause when you tell people that you're in a book, <laughs> they buy your book. <laughs> hey, you know what? Now, I, appre- I appreciate but, the hey, honesty. <laughs> gra- gratitude is not only something that's instant, instantaneous, and great for happiness and all that kind of jazz, but it's also just fucking great for business. Mm. Great. I mean, we yeah. built an entire company on that. And and that's a, you mentioned that so many occasions in the book as well about the the big players that you've had these big company uh, people that are running companies and actually are they they sat down with their folks in a whole different way and it created the conversation and it sparked connection. Mm-hmm. And for that, what a beautiful way to, to know that you're going to work every day and have that to take home. So one last thing I'd love to know before you, before I let you go, what is one takeaway that you would leave with listeners that joined us today? Pick a date. Mm. Pick a date. That's it, man. The- I was thinking about it last night, along with my elements and my five finger plan. <laughs> <laughs> I was with you. Yeah, uh, pick a pick, date. That's pick, good. Pick a date. Uh, the the I don't know what the statistics are, but majority of people who have a dream, who have a vision, mm-hmm. who want to do good, they fail to make the first step. And mm-hmm. and the first step, as we've proven it time and time again, pick a date, work backwards. That's it. Love it. That's it. Great. Chris, such a pleasure to share the table with you today. And uh, for our listeners, again, Chris Shembra, get his book, Gratitude and Pasta, The Secret Sauce for Human Connection. It's about gratitude. It's about empathy. It's about connection. 
And that's really what it's all about. So thanks so much, Chris. And thank you for listening to this episode of Holistically Speaking. Make sure to visit me online at hillaryrusso.com and follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Hillary Russo. The show is produced by Alan Seals with music by Lipbone Redding. And to keep listening, all you have to do is find me at Holistically Speaking on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and everywhere else you tune in. Until next time, be safe, be well, and don't forget to laugh. <laughs>